Hello, and thank you to Claire for inviting me to participate in this session. I'm excited to talk to you about fate of methane in the warming Arctic. So I will go over the sources and sinks of methane in the Arctic Ocean. I will talk about the methane climate feedback specific to the Arctic Ocean. And then I will also cover in the course of the talk state of the science on existing methane hydrates and subsea permafrost in Arctic sediment and the roles that microbes play in producing and consuming methane and present some evidence and outlook on the role that the methane climate feedback can play in the Arctic today and tomorrow. So this is a sort of roadmap of sources and sinks of methane. Um, with uh, I've shown in green terrestrial sources, in blue sources and sinks in the water column, in brown components in sediments and the atmosphere in black. So this is um, all the pathways that methane can come to be dissolved in the Arctic Ocean methane pool. Um, you'll see that microbes play a key role in these different domains, both in transforming organic matter that's in sediments or terrestrial organic matter, um, marine organic matter, and converting it to methane. They also play a key role, um, different microbes, uh, play a key role in removing that methane from the waters, transforming it to CO2, part of the carbonate system. Gas hydrates are one of the largest carbon reservoirs on Earth, and um, they're actually not a true source of methane. They're rather a pseudo source. Uh, they're derived mainly from uh, deep-seated geologic reservoirs, so that methane migrates up from the Earth's interior and it can become stable at certain pressure, at medium pressure, low temperature conditions in the continental margins of the world. Um, and with present day warming, as well as warming throughout the Holocene, uh, gas hydrates can become destabilized and release the methane that they contain. Another um, source or component here that can become a source of methane via microbes is subsea permafrost, which is, exists in the Arctic continental margins on the shelf. But again, it's been subject to warming throughout the Holocene and still today. Um, so it has degraded substantially over the Holocene, but um, still exists today. Um, schematically, uh, this is another view of some of these sources. So you see that permafrost on land is much thicker than the permafrost um, just shown here, uh, which has been inundated throughout the Holocene and has um, either degraded completely far out towards the edge of the shelf or exists in these narrower horizons in uh, closer to the coastline, present day coastline. Um, and leaving behind in their wake, they can leave behind, you know, dissociating gas hydrates. Um, they also have uh, microbial production in surface sediments. And these are those deep-seated uh, geologic reservoirs, um, which can migrate up through fault lines. Some of the Arctic has active faulting. Some are in passive margins. So it really just depends on where you're at. Um, a more expanded view of the Arctic shelf system. Now we're also seeing the slope. This is where the majority of gas hydrates reside in the world. They mostly reside below 300 in waters that are 300 meters and deeper. Um, and, but some do also exist on the shelf, but Carolyn Rupel will tell you that they're not ubiquitous um, and they're not um, found everywhere, but they are there to a much more limited extent 
than in these deeper waters, which is something to keep in mind for the rest of my talk. Also in red here, you can see the methane sinks. Um, here we have very strong aerobic oxidation of methane in ocean waters. We also have a lot of consumption in sediments, um, as well as removal in the atmosphere. Methane has a lifetime of, of about 10 years, um, which is much shorter on average than CO2, but it, uh, we all care about methane because it's much more potent greenhouse gas. So that's why it is quite of interest. So here's uh, the Arctic Ocean Methane Climate Feedback, um, where, whereby with our rising greenhouse gas concentrations, warming temperatures, we're destabilizing these frozen sources of methane and sediments, leading to increase in methane emissions to ocean waters, leading to an increase in methane emissions to the atmosphere, and, and on, which is very scary. Except that maybe it's not. Um, there are some significant uncertainties about this feedback loop. So although we know that rising temperatures will destabilize the sources in sediments, it's um, uncertain how the microbes in sediments will respond to this, whether they will aggressively consume that methane once it's present in sediments. And same goes for any um, methane that is then emitted to the ocean waters, how aggressive that microbial methane consumption can be in ocean waters. Um, next one to just point out that um, been advised that we not put the cart before the horse in terms of um, calling something a positive feedback loop when really might be just observing methane concentrations that are elevated. But how long they've been elevated um, may not be immediately clear. And just because you um, have observed um, a, uh, elevated concentrations of methane in seawater doesn't mean that it's changing in response to present-day Arctic warming. Um, this is a figure showing that we have um, the present-day estimation of gas hydrates um, is about uh, is five times less than it was thought to be about 30 years ago. Um, so it's about 1,800 petagrams, as Claire had mentioned and is one of the major carbon reservoirs. Um, and then if we then look at this figure on the right, this shows the different sources of methane to the atmosphere, and also showing hydrates here with this tiny blue sliver here at six teragrams per year. It's pretty small. But it's also a completely made up number. It's just been put, it has no observational basis, it's just been um, carried through from IPCC report to IPCC report. So um, it's good to keep in mind that we haven't been able to directly observe this number. Um, and I would definitely advise anyone who's really interested in this topic, perhaps they already know of it, but this great review paper by Carolyn Ruppel and John Kessler from 2017 for further information. Um, the extent of subsea permafrost has become, is becoming better and better known across the Arctic. This is a recent distribution map from Paul Overdune, um, and it is a, a model, modeling study, and it's a first order uh, approximation of where permafrost lies today based on sea level rise from interglacial and glacial transitions and the thermal um, changes associated with that. And from this map, uh, it's estimated that about 80% of the permafrost in the Arctic shelf seas lies in just three of these seas here in the East Siberian Sea, the Laptev Sea, and the Kara Sea. But what this model agrees, this model agrees well with observations where uh, we have directly observed where permafrost exists today. 
um, with seismic techniques. This is, shows a study from Laura Brothers and Carolyn Ruppel. And it's no longer, um, we now know for sure that the extent of subsea permafrost is not to the shelf edge or to the 100 or 120 meter isobath. Um, it is instead existing in uh, much further inshore, um, closer to shore. This is the estimate here from these two different seismic studies, this white and red bands. And similar studies have been done in Canada. Um, this is interesting to note that like this um, part of the Beaufort Sea, the US Beaufort Sea is a classic passive margin, whereas the Canadian side of the Beaufort Sea is a, a convergent margin. So these are two very different areas and it leads to somewhat of the difference in um, the extent of permafrost that exists there today. Um, they confirmed these seismic uh, surveys, which is still shown here as this red line, with borehole well log data, where they found um, high saturation ice bonded permafrost, here shown in red, um, inside of this line, um, consistent with the seismic techniques. Um, and some of these are from islands, actually, in the sea. So those have um, still a lot of that permafrost left over. But again, it's just existing. It means that it's existing in some parts of these sediments, but it's still only at certain horizons within the sediment. And it's only in waters that are less than 25 meters deep. So something to keep in mind. Uh, next, I want to talk about bubbles and seeps. And um, this is an image from off of Svalbard, an area where there is active hydrates, or there are existing hydrates. Um, and uh, it's from 250 meters depth. You see these bubbles rising, these methane bubbles rising all the way to the sea surface, a direct connection to the atmosphere. Right? Wrong. <laughs> Just testing you. Um, this is uh, bubbles for sure, but um, these bubbles are, of methane are not making it all the way to the sea surface, which you can see um, from this diagram here. A bubble is released from 200 meters depth uh, depending on the size, the smaller the bubble, the more likely it is that it can contain its methane as it rises in the, um, throughout the water column. Because what happens is that as the bubble rises, nitrogen and oxygen are fluxing in, methane is fluxing out, so you might not have any methane by the time you reach the sea surface, especially in deeper waters, but depending on the bubble size. So if you have like a bubble that's like half an inch in diameter, um, and it's released from 100 meters water depth. It might have about 10% of the methane that it originally had. Um, but if you move up to 50 meters, it might contain more, like closer to 50% of its methane at the sea surface. Um, we know that methane consumption is very, um, can be very effective even in quite shallow waters of 100 or 150 meters depth. These are both studies from Svalbard that show that. Um, that there's high methane in the bottom waters of this, in the shelf, but in the surface waters, here it's um, anything above the picnic line, you have background values of methane. So showing that microbial sink can be very active. Um, move on. Also, another st source of methane that I haven't talked about is the in situ production of methane in oxic waters, which has been um, more recently it's becoming better understood every year. Um, but we now know that um, even coccolithophores uh, can be associated with producing methane um, through a series of different metabolic pathways. Um, I don't think I have time to go really into this study in, in depth, but basically you add um, C13 labeled substrates along with uh, cultures of e -hux then you have more methane in these bottles than if you don't have EHUX there, um, which is very interesting. And these are all normalized to the cell counts. So, interesting. Oh, yeah. So question that I wanted to answer, uh, this was for my, with my PhD work, was are these ancient sources of methane being emitted to the Arctic Ocean, um, from the Arctic Ocean to the atmosphere? You know, how, what role do these ancient sources play 
relative to the modern sources of methane. Uh, we conducted a study here in the shallow coastal Beaufort Sea off of Alaska. This was in late summer 2015. We really wanted to go to this ground zero location of very shallow water depths. So we were sampling from 2 to 40 meters uh, water depths. And we conducted a natural abundance radiocarbon study in order to separate um, ancient sources from modern sources. Uh, we even got to be ice road truckers. This is me carrying all of our gear um, up the <laughs> uh, haul road here. And we were on a very small boat so that we could access these very shallow waters. So we conducted a radiocarbon isotope mass balance in this sea. We measured the radiocarbon content of atmospheric methane, atmospheric CO2. We measured radiocarbon of DIC. And then we measured uh, radiocarbon of methane in surface waters and near, near seafloor waters. And we conducted just a surface sample and a near seafloor sample, which you might say, uh, why only two samples, not a whole profile? Sounds pretty lazy. Well, each sample was collected from 30,000 liters of seawater. So it took a little while to collect each sample. So uh, we developed these methods in Rochester. I was at the swimming pools a lot, testing out our equipment. Um, <laughs> and here we are. I'm taking up the whole back of the boat with all the equipment. Um, we're pumping water aboard the vessel and then extracting all of the dissolved gases out of the seawater, inflating this big balloon with all of the gases from seawater. So mainly nitrogen and oxygen, but trace amounts of methane. We then compress this balloon into a tiny cylinder to take back to the lab where I purified it um, to prepare it for the radiocarbon analysis. And what we found was that there is a distinct decoupling of the surface and deep waters. Uh, so this is our results listed by the station with increasing depth. So from 2 meters all the way to 40 meters. And I'm going to draw your attention here to the deeper stations where we're finding in the near sea floor that the methane that we sampled there was composed of about 90% of it was from ancient sources here at this station. And in the surface water at that same station, the methane was dominantly from modern sources. So 90% was from modern sources at the surface water. And similar story in the next deepest station. It was less ancient, but about 95% modern in the surface water. Um, shown with a map view. Here is the results presented in a different way, um, with the blue colors indicating the modern sources. And we also see, that, so it's the blue and the purple that indicate more modern sources in the surface waters, whereas the red colors indicate that it's about 50-50. So there's about, the methane's composed of about 50% from ancient sources and 50% from modern sources. Um, and we were sampling inside of this. This is the um, uh, existing permafrost boundary. So we were sampling inside and outside of this boundary, um, and also near some rivers, which is interesting. So overall, our study proves the existence of the Arctic Ocean methane climate feedback because we found that these ancient sources are being mobilized in the shelf waters. But we also found that the methane removal processes are surprisingly strong, even in the shallow waters of just 30 meters and 40 meters depth, which was really exciting. Um, and it's worth noting that you know, even though we have quite large um, methane sources and re relatively high methane concentrations in Arctic Ocean waters, that the growth rates of methane in the atmosphere 
um, over the Arctic are comparable to or less than the global average. So atmospheric scientists aren't really that excited about the Arctic or concerned about it. They're actually looking a lot at the tropics, which is where the dominant sources of natural methane are emitted from. It's also where um, the largest sink, atmospheric sink of methane exists. So there's lots of transfer variability with climate change there. So just something interesting to note. As well, the majority of the um, hydrate reservoir, just to say it one more time, lies way out here past the shelf break in waters that are 10 times as deep as the, the waters that we were in, which we expect the methane removal processes to be exponentially greater in those deep waters. So even as hydrates warm, the methane climate feedback may not play a large role. So that, thank you for taking your questions. All right, that should stimulate some uh, questions. Wagner from Harvard University. I was wondering, you talk about methane removal, right? But it's really a transformation to organic carbon, and so it still enters the fast carbon cycle and may not actually be removed from producing forms of climate change long term. Um, sure. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I think that's totally valid, yes. Um, but I guess, yeah, my main focus has been just as far as the atmospheric connection, just because you know, the emission of methane could change climate very rapidly. So I generally think about that. But that's absolutely true, I would say, yeah. I don't think about that much. Other questions? Hi, hi Katie. Hi. Uh, great work. Seems like very hard measurements or samples to even uh, acquire, but uh, I have to ask, is there any C13 for that data? Yes, yes, there is C13. Um, the major takeaway, it, we collected C13 with every sample, um, as you know. Um, but um, with C13 data, if you had only the methane concentration data and the C13 data for this study, they just um, propagate the traditional view of methane dynamics in the ocean, which is that you have um, methane sourced from the seafloor, and it ascends in the water column, and is consumed along the way, a small portion of that emitted to the waters. You know, because you have lighter methane in the deep waters, and it's heavier in the surface. It was that way in each of our stations. It was just you know, lighter methane in the deep waters, more enriched in the surface, which would just say that consumption had happened, it could have still been that same ancient source. That's all that you would have maybe guessed at. But with the radiocarbon, it proved that it was two different sources in the deep water and the surface water. Other questions? Yeah, Leonard Bach. Um, I was wondering, uh, there seems to be a uh, an unexpected increase in atmospheric temperatures in, in methane over the past years. As far as I know, I'm not an expert on this, and I was wondering why this is. Did you ask what, there's an increase in temperatures or an increase in No, no, in increase methane? in methane in the atmosphere, an unexpectedly large increase over the last years. Mm. Well, it is on the rise again, that's for sure. Um, uh, but it's not from the Arctic. Um, that's what the recent studies that I've seen have been saying. Um, I think we're coming to understand more the role of, um, I've definitely seen some papers that have said that we're underestimating emissions from human sources, like from natural gas industry, fossil fuel industry in general, um, that there's suggestions that those um, uh, emissions estimates are biased low. Um, but, and then tropical wetland expansion is a very big source, I think, of uh, methane to the atmosphere. Yes. 
Permafrost, you said not the Arctic, but I assume you mean not the Arctic Ocean. Do you know much about microbial activity that produces methane and permafrost and how that's been affected by warming climate? Well, um, yeah, well, I think but the same studies that I'm thinking of that are saying the Arctic methane growth rate is comparable to or less than the global average is talking about all of the Arctic, not just the Arctic Ocean, just the whole Arctic atmosphere. So, um, removal in permafrost, as it does in those soils, is also an active process. So, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we'll uh, ponder that over a break. Um, <laughs> We have sources and sinks, clearly, for methane as well as other forms of carbon.